All right, everybody, thank you for joining us today for a very exciting Permafrost Discovery Gateway mm -hmm. webinar. My name is Juliet, and I'm a new member of the Arctic Data Center team as an assistant data scientist. And I work on processing data layers for the Permafrost Discovery Gateway. And so I just like to introduce the webinar series. Um, it aims to connect the international science community interested in big data, remote sensing of, of permafrost landscapes, as well as provide the permafrost discovery gateway development team with end user stories, such as exploring tools the community needs to create and explore big data. So today we're very lucky to be joined by Helena Bergstedt, who will be sharing her work on mapping drained lake basins in lowland permafrost regions on a circumpolar scale. So we will start with her presentation and then we're gonna open up to discussion at the end. And the only the presentation portion will be recorded, not the discussion. So for a little background on Helena, she earned her bachelor's degree in geoecology and her master's degree in geography with an emphasis in hydrology and remote sensing. She then went on to earn her PhD at University of Salzburg in Austria, where she worked on microwave remote sensing applications in permafrost regions. After completing her PhD, she went on to a postdoc position at University of Alaska Fairbanks with Ben Jones, where she worked on developing a scalable remote sensing based mapping approach for drained lake basins in lowland permafrost regions. Finally, after her postdoc, she moved to Vienna to work at BGOs, where she currently is, as she continues her work on regional to circumpolar remote sensing analysis. Uh, ben and Annette, would you like to add anything to Helena's introduction? Yeah, hi. Hi, good morning. Sorry, I just hopped on and caught the tail end of that. Um, Nice to see you, Helena. Nice to see everybody. Look forward to the presentation. Hi. Great. So uh, we can go ahead and pass it off to Helena then uh, to give her presentation, and we'll open it up for questions afterwards. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, let me share my slides. We can um, see how that works, or if that works. Um, Give me just one second. Um, yes. So you should see um, the presentation now. Great. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present this here in this really cool webinar series. Um, I've been working on mapping drained lake basins for a couple of years now. I'm really excited to see how far this work has come and uh, to share it with you today. So this presentation is going to be all about um, drained lake basins and lowland permafrost regions all across the Arctic. And the first, we're gonna start off with why do we wanna map them in the first place? Sorry, my slides are not advancing. Oh, now they are advancing, great. <laughs> starting off uh, seamlessly. So drain lake basins. Um, they're really uh, common features in um, permafrost regions in the Arctic. Um, depending on the region you're looking at, they can cover between 50 and 75 per, um, percent of the landscape in certain parts of Alaska, Siberia, or Canada. And you can see here on this picture that I took from a helicopter while I was working in Alaska that they're really distinct features and they're really, um, yeah, distinct from their surrounding um, surfaces. And they have been mapped in the past with remote sensing. So, so this is possible and this has been done before, but um, previously until um, our work here, this has only been done in local to regional studies and large scale studies on this have been missing. But because there are such common features all across the Arctic, it would be really interesting to also have a circumpolar picture of where we can find how many drained lake basins. And here I have just one more like background slide for those of you who are maybe not so familiar with um, permafrost regions, because I don't know everyone's background here, but this is a really cool uh, figure that's from a paper that came out earlier this year by Ben Jones, who is also 
in the audience and um, really nicely depicting um, why these basins are so common in um, these regions. And from left to right, we can see here a landscape um, evolving, developing with lake initiate, init, initiation taking place um, widespread all across the area and drained lake basins appearing in a later stage. And also we can see that this mosaic of drained lake basins, residual surfaces that had, have not been lakes before and current lakes um, is really, uh, yeah, it's a mosaic of those different landscapes types that keeps evolving and new lakes keep developing and lakes keep draining. So it's a dynamic landscape and it's really um, made up of these different types and um, drained lake basins are really important feature in this. Um, and so our mapping approach. So the, in this, um, yeah, in this webinar series, because it's um, all about data and data products, I'm going to explain to you a little bit um, the mapping approach a little bit more in detail than I usually do in these presentations. Usually I focus on the why and the results, but I thought maybe the audience here is also a little bit interested in the how. Um, and so our data, our aim was that we are going to be able to cover the circumpolar region. So we can only use data that will be available for the entire Arctic. And so as one of the inputs, the most important input, um, we use Landsat 8 imagery. And for this, um, there's like one of the, those mosaics that I created is here as an example for the North Slope, but I created these mosaics for the entire Arctic. And to be able to cover the entire Arctic, I um, used imagery that not only from one year, but from multiple years, in this case, from 2014 until 2019. Um, to be able to cover the entire Arctic um, cloud-free and uh, with high enough um, yeah, coverage for all regions. And from this Landsat um, imagery, I uh, derived the tassel cap index. For those um, who are not familiar with this, this is an index you um, can derive from um, multispectral imagery that basically gives you information about brightness, greenness, and wet wetness per pixel. And so this is one of the main inputs of our analysis of our mapping approach for drained lake basins. And another very important um, input is um, a digital elevation model. And in an early version that I'll be presenting on the next couple of slides, an early version of this drained lake basin mapping, I've been focusing on the Arctic DM. Um, so everything that I'm going to present that focused on Alaska in this presentation, um, the Arctic DM went into this, but since I've expanded it to the circumpolar region, I've been using the Copernicus DM um, because I have found that over certain regions that has a little bit fewer artifacts and was a little bit easier to handle for those areas. Um, so based on this, um, based on the Landsat imagery and based on the tassel cap index that I derived from the Landsat imagery, um, I calculated the local Morantzai, which is a measure of spatial association. So you can imagine it a little bit like a clustering technique or something like this, where we get information for each pixel, whether or not this um, is uh, belong belongs to a local cluster, a, a local grouping of pixels, or whether or not it um, is an outlier or part of a more or less randomly distributed values. And so one of the main assumptions of this map mapping approach is that drained lake basins um, form uh, are sort of unique feature features that um, are different from their surrounding landscapes. And while not all drained lake basins are similar to each other, they're different, they're all different from their surroundings. So that's what's unique about them and what we rely on, on in our mapping. And then to refine this a little bit, because if you just do this step, there's still a lot of noise in the data. And it's also important for us to mask out mountainous areas because we're interested in lowland permafrost regions, but it's also uh, important to mask out um, narrow river channels, um, local ridges, those kind of features. And for that, we rely on the DM that I mentioned before. So that's what we get from the topographic information. And all of this, um, we published a prototype of this um, 
which I think is already has been ingested into the um, but we can discuss that later, I suppose, but I believe it's already, um, so it's, it's published on the Arctic Data Center since 2021. And the paper that goes with it is also published and I show the references in the end, but I th believe it's also already ingested in the permafrost discovery gateway, if I'm not wrong. Um, and this um, data set has, uh, was calibrated using a bunch of manually classified random points um, and validated against also a different set of um, manually classified, classified points, but also previously published data sets. Um, yeah, and so you, you see this example of the data set that of the prototype um, that's covering the Alaska North Slope. And it, you can see it here on the bottom right part of the slide. And you see the, the no drained lake basin area, um, in orange, the drained lake basin areas in um, this blue, bluish color. And then you see a third class, class that um, I called ambiguous. And this is basically, we introduced this class to give the users or the possible users of our data some freedom on how they would like to approach this data set. So of course, like in any mapping algorithm, there are some areas where we thought our um, mapping approach might not work as well or where there's a little bit less confidence just in in the results and to give the users some freedom on how to approach those situations we introduce this ambiguous class so if you for example would like to use this as an input in your model but you want to be really conservative about what areas might be drained lake basins you may only focus on the blue areas but if you are saying oh for me it's more important that no drained lake basins are left out or you would like to compare those two situations you could include both uh, the ambiguous and the drained lake basin class in as from the data so that's why we that's why this uh, third class exists basically to to give some flexibility to the user um, yes about the comparison with local to regional scale data um, we compared it to a number of different previously published data sets that come from um, manual mapping, local knowledge, all kind of different approaches. Um, also those uh, citations I will have at the end. And they're also available on the Arctic Data Center. And um, yeah, here I just have two comparisons, both from the Alaska area, both um, all these figures are also part in the already published manuscripts. Later, I will show you some unpublished things, but this is still all the things that have already been published and are available online. Um, so here you can see, uh, yeah, the, the same color scheme as we saw in the figure before, and we were quite happy with how these, um, how our data matched up with this previously published data set. Um, you can see the black lines um, tracing drained lake basins that were um, included in, in this previously published data sets. And at least in our opinion, those matched up quite well with um, what, our, uh, what our results were. And um, so now moving on to the circumpolar scale. Um, and the prototype only covered the North Slope, but we were interested in um, the, the, the Pan-Arctic picture, and uh, for the last couple of years, there has been an action group um, under the umbrella of the IPA, the International Permafrost Association, on these drain, on uh, mapping these drain lake basins for the Pan-Arctic area. And um, this is a community effort led by me and Ben, Ben Jones. Um, and there's like three main pillars of this, or two and a half main pillars, so maybe, of this of this action group. Uh, one of them is this creation of this um, of this remote sensing based um, Drain Lake uh, Basin map. Um, and one is also the collection and cre creation of an age database for Drain Lake Basin ages, uh, basically a collection of field data. So this is also part, and then part of this was also the publication of this Jones et al. 2022 um, nature review paper on drained lake basins that where I showed the one of the figures before. But my part is mainly the, the map, the Panarctic data product. And um, 
you can see here in dark gray all the areas that we're focusing on for this data product. Um, and we constrained the study area quite generously, but we did constrain the study area by um, using a data set published by Olefeld et al. in 2016, um, which is basically a data set about all kinds of different um, thermocarst landscapes. And we focused specifically on lake thermocarst landscapes. And so wherever, um, according to this data set, lake thermocarst um, can occur, we um, then uh, run our mapping algorithm to see um, to, to map those strained lake basins. Um, yes, and so what's the status of this? Um, as I already mentioned before, the input data, the Landsat 8 imagery is the same time period and the same approach as was for the uh, data set that only covered the Alaska North Slope. And um, so the status is, you can see here in these nice colors, so basically I've been, uh, in the beginning, I was focusing on certain areas across the Arctic, uh, including areas in Siberia, like the Yamal Peninsula, um, like some areas in Canada, like the Inuvik region, um, Old Crow Flats, some um, area on uh, south of the Hudson Bay. And those are mainly areas that were of interest to uh, collaboration partners, to project partners, and also areas where I had some uh, availability of local knowledge of previously published data sets. And, um, but basically I've run my analysis for all these areas. The orange areas are still, um, the calibration is currently ongoing, but um, first uncalibrated, uh, uncalibrated results already, um, already exist. And for the blue areas, which includes the North Slope of Alaska, um, those calibrated uh, data is already shown. However, validation is still, still needs to happen. And um, yes, so now to some examples of this area. So this is an example for the, um, for, for the North Slope. Um, you already saw some zoomed in versions of that before when we looked at the comparison with the previous, previously published data. Um, but this is even a little bit uh, more of a close up, I guess. And you can see the comparison here with uh, the Landsat mosaic um, on, on the left side and uh, the, the data set classification on, on the right. And um, yeah, again, we were quite happy on how well our approach was able to capture those strained lake basins. Um, for those of you who are maybe not as familiar as I have become at looking at those um, satellite images and immediately picking out the drained lake basins. I don't know if I have a laser pointer device on Zoom, but um, I think so. Laser pointer. I don't know if you can see my, I, I see you are nodding, excellent. So you can see here on the imagery already, there's some quite distinct features, which are these drained lake basins. They come in different shapes and sizes. They're overlapping here. They are not always um, one separate basin, but as we saw in the overview figure right in the beginning, new basins can form in the old basin. So those are overlapping features, um, difficult to distinguish where exactly the borders are between the features. But our mapping approach was quite successful in capturing the different types of basins, different sizes. So we were quite happy with this. and. Um, for results in Siberia, so this is an example from the Yamal Peninsula. Um, this is quite a different scale than before. So this is, uh, you can see here is the one kilometer scale bar. So it's quite the, the big basin. Um, and this was one of the first areas where I was testing out uh, our approach um, outside of Alaska. And so I was quite happy that also in a different setting with quite the different, um, yeah, it's just, you never know if you um, develop this one approach specifically for the North Slope, how well will it perform in other regions? Um, so we were also quite happy with this um, first attempt on expanding into the Panarctic um, scale. And so this is, I think, quite a good example of um, of how it performs there, but you can also see the importance of the ambiguous class. There's some areas at the edges and in the um, 
bottom part of the of this example where there's some errors with the ambiguous class where um, you could imagine that some users might um, would like to keep these areas included in the data set, but others might like to focus only on the on the areas where we can say for sure that those are drain lake basins. And as another example, uh, also from Siberia, from the Chesky area, um, this has again quite a different scale. So you, you have a 10 kilometer scale bar up here. Um, and also here, I think the, the mapping approach worked quite nicely. Again, you can see here the comparison to the, um, to the high resolution imagery. Um, you can see all kinds of types of drained lake basins. Um, and you can see how they compare here in the, in the classification. And yeah, again, we were quite, quite pleased with how this turned out. Um, again, a quite different um, setting compared to the Yamaha Peninsula, compared to the North Slope in Alaska, but still it work, is working quite well. And one of the reasons why I also chose this example um, specifically to look at is because it highlights the importance of why we don't only use um, the Lancet imagery, but also use the digital elevation model. Um, you can see here some areas in the classification that are very clearly not drained lake basins in this area that's full of drained lake basins. This is another reason why I chose this area. This is just full of drained lake basins and they're all, almost all of them are very nicely captured. But there's also some areas that are clearly not drained lake basins and they come out very well in the classification. And the reason is because we have included the digital elevation model it's because these areas are um, ridges or elevated from the from the lower lying um, basins. And with just the Lancet imagery, we don't always um, distinguish well between those areas and the, the basins that are so prominent in these regions. Um, yeah, and with that, I actually already come to my outlook. I believe I was a little bit too fast, but um, that just leaves us more room for questions. Um, so what's the, What's, what will the future bring for this? Um, first, I would like to invite everyone who is going to aid you to stop by our Drain Lake Basin session that will happen on Friday. Um, so if you're staying until Friday at AGU, please stop by. Um, there's gonna be lots of great posters. Um, it's, um, I think I'm really excited for it. And I think it's not only remote sensing, so you can learn about Drain Lake Basin for, from all kinds of points of view and um, disciplines. And there's also going to be a dedicated um, Grand Lake Basin session where you would still have time to submit abstracts to, for example, for at the European Conference on Permafrost in 2023, which will be held in Spain. So if anyone fancies, fancies that. Um, this is also open to all kinds of disciplines, not only remote sensing based, but also if you're a modeler, for example, also very welcome. And then of course we want to publish this. As I said, the prototype has already been published. The data set is published as well as the, the accompanying paper, but we also want to of course publish the circumpolar product and also a paper to go with it. So that's in the works. And then we're also of course this, we believe this has some great potential for future applications. So we don't just want to publish the data set and say goodbye, but we also want to use it for things. Um, like upscaling field data, for example, as we all know, the Arctic is quite hard to reach in certain areas. Some areas are hard to do field work in and hard to collect data. So remote sensing data is great for that. And hopefully we will um, have some nice um, upscaling um, successes using this data set. Um, and that, of course, there's also uh, then work ongoing to connect it to other parts of the action group like the the H base the H um, database that I mentioned in the beginning where action group members are hard working hard to collect all kinds of field data and so that's also something to look forward to and with that um, there's the references I promised you but so it's, um, I'm also happy to send you the links to the datasets um, if you would like 
Um, then I would like, of course, to thank all the people who funded me over the years. I was part of an NSF project with when I was working with Ben. Currently, I'm part of the QArctic project um, at BGEOS, which is an ERC project. And also, I would like to thank the IPA for funding our action group um, for the last couple of years. It was really, really cool. Um, yeah, thank you all for your attention and for showing up to this uh, webinar that's for some of you quite late and for some of you quite early. So I pre really appreciate it.